Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please support my channel by contributing to my Patreon account so that I can continue making the audiobook series. The book continues with part 1, which tells in detail the conquest of Egypt, which happened under the Rashidun Caliphate from 639 AD to 646 AD. This conquest brought an end to the Roman Byzantine reign over Egypt, which first began in 30 BC. Egypt was also conquered and occupied by the Sassanid Empire from 618 AD to 629 AD from the Byzantines before it was reconquered by Emperor Heraclius. Start of Chapter 7 The Advance to Alexandria Heraclius, Emperor of Byzantium, was now an old man. He was also an embittered man thanks to the Muslims. Fortune which had once smiled upon him had lately forsaken him but he had basked in its kindly light long enough to earn the respect of the historian as one of the great emperors of Rome. Though not born to the purple, Heraclius was nevertheless noble-born. His father had been viceroy, ex-arch of Africa, which meant North Africa, west of Egypt. He came to the throne in 610 AD when the affairs of the Eastern Roman Empire were at a very low ebb. When the empire consisted of little more than the area around Constantinople and parts of Greece and Africa, and when the enemies of the empire, bent upon its total annihilation, were knocking at the gates of the capital. The empire had known bad days in its long and tumultuous history but none worse than these. Soon after this coronation, young Heraclius almost gave up and wished to return to Africa, regarding the task of saving the empire as a hopeless one. But he was persuaded to stay and subsequently not only saved the empire, but restored it to the heights of glory which it had known in better periods of its history. In a campaign spread over two decades, he defeated the barbarians of the north, the Avars, the Slavs, the Bulgars, and other allied marauders, and finally trounced the Persian Empire. The defeat of the Persians in 628 AD, after several battles over several years, was the greatest triumph of Heraclius, and he achieved these military successes by flawless strategy and superb organization, which enabled him to put a vast imperial army in the field and maneuver it with skill and confidence. Then came the rise of the Muslim power, the message of Islam, manifested in the words of the Quran and conveyed by Prophet Muhammad wasallam, as the last apostle of God, had to be conveyed to all mankind. And after the Prophet's death, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in 11 Hijri 632 AD, Abu Bakr anhu, the first Caliph of Islam, took it upon himself to convey that message. Two years after the Prophet, he launched the campaign of Syria. Heraclius rose to defend his empire and to retain his hard-won gains. He organized an army of 100,000 men and placed it at Ajnadain in Palestine. But his army was soundly thrashed by a Muslim army of 32,000 men under Khalid bin al-Walid anhu. This battle was fought in July 634. The Muslims went on to Damascus, which fell after a short siege. Heraclius again organized a large army with the intention of throwing the Muslims back into the desert. But at the Battle of Fahal in January 635, the Romans were again defeated by the Muslims. Following their success, the Muslims recaptured Damascus and went on to take Amasa and Al-
Once again, Heraclius made a valiant effort to stem the tide of Muslim conquest and put into the field a vast army of 150,000 imperial soldiers. Once again, the Romans were defeated. At Yermuk in August 636, after six days of bloody, vicious fighting, Khalid annihilated this Roman army and sent the survivors fleeing in disorder from the battlefield. Next came the siege of Jerusalem, which surrendered to Caliph Umar in April 637. Again, the Muslims advanced north and reoccupied the cities which they had earlier captured and then abandoned. This time they went on to Antioch, another great city of Syria, and one of the choicest pearls in the crown of the Eastern Roman Empire. Here was fought the last major battle between Heraclius and Islam, and the Romans were decisively defeated by Abu Ubadah in October 637. Heraclius knew that never again would he have the power to take Syria from the Muslims. He travelled northwards, and as he reached the border of Syria, he turned to take a last sorrowing look at this fair province of the empire. He lamented, Salutations, O Syria, and farewell from one who departs. Never again shall the Roman return to thee except in fear. O what a fine land I leave to the enemy. Heraclius was no longer the man he once had been and this explains why he had not taken adequate measures to defend Egypt against the Muslims. Perhaps because the traditional enemies of Rome were the Persians, and most of the wars between Rome and Persia over nearly 12 centuries of imperial rivalry had been fought in Asia Minor, Syria, and Mesopotamia, and very few in Egypt, Heraclius was more concerned with Asia Minor and the direct route between the imperial capitals than with Egypt. But the easy successes of Umar bin Alas at Fermat and Bilbis brought to his attention the vulnerability of Egypt and the magnitude of the Muslim threat. He directed Macaucus to take strong measures for the defense of Egypt, but here too the new faith of Islam carried the day and Babylon and Memphis fell to the Muslims. Heraclius' star was setting. In a long reign during which he had found no peace and little rest, he had had to swallow many bitter pills, mostly at the hands of the Muslims. While the blows which the new Muslim state inflicted upon him took away much of the luster which he had gained over twenty years of glorious campaigning, internally his position was weakened by the religious controversy mentioned in the preceding chapter. His efforts to achieve religious unity among a disunited people made him even more unpopular, especially in Egypt, where his banning of the Coptic form of worship did not endear him to the Copts. His declining image was further tarnished by an act of incest. He married his own niece, Martina. But there was life left in the old campaigner and he was not about to surrender another fair province to Islam without a fight. The interior of Egypt was lost, but he still held the coast and the Roman navy was still the dominant force in the Mediterranean. He still had Alexandria, the queen of cities, and if the Muslims wanted Alexandria, they could come and get it. Having severely reprimanded his viceroy, in fact having roundly abused him, Heraclius sent more forces by sea to Alexandria with orders to defend the city at all cost. The Roman army quickly got down to repairing the ramparts of Alexandria and preparing it for battle. In this manner, the Roman emperor served notice on the Muslim commander-in-chief in Egypt that the war was still on. Amr bin Alas had remained in Babylon for two months since the fall of the city. As news of the movements of Roman forces and the preparations being made at Alexandria was brought to him, he wrote to Umar anhu about the situation and sought his permission to advance upon Alexandria. A returning messenger brought the caliph's orders to take Alexandria. 
Amal bin Alas left a small garrison to look after Babylon and gave orders for the rest of the army. About 12,000 soldiers to march to Alexandria. It was the month of Rabiul Awal, 20 Hijri, February to March, 641. For the Battle of Babylon, Amr had pitched his tent about a quarter of a mile northeast of the fort. The tent also acted as the army headquarters during the Battle of Babylon. Amr had remained in this tent when the fighting was over, and it was here that he had met Macaucus and agreed to bury him upon his death in the church of St. John in Alexandria. Whenever he was in the tent, Amr could hear the cooing of a dove from above, but he paid no attention to it. When the time came to go, Amr ordered his men to pull down his tent and pack it for the journey. It was then that he was informed that a dove had nested on top of the tent and laid eggs and the eggs had hatched. The nest was inhabited by the mother dove and its dovelings, and it was the cooing of this dove that Amr had heard. This was a strange and unusual experience for a general like Amr bin al -As. The man who had spent a lifetime in the saddle, sword in hand, the man who had commanded armies in bloody battles, in which thousands had perished, and who had slain with his own hands scores of Romans and Greeks and Copts, was now being told by a gentle slave that there was a dove with her little ones in a nest atop his tent. If the tent were taken down, as ordered by him, the poor little things would die. It took Amr only a moment to make up his mind about what to do with the dove. She has taken sanctuary with us, he said to his men. Let the tent remain until her young ones have flown away. Not only was the tent left in place, but the commander of the garrison in Babylon was charged with the responsibility of seeing that it was not disturbed. The tent remained standing until the nestlings had grown up and flown away. Alexandria stood west of the western branch of the Nile. East of this branch lay the delta, crisscrossed by innumerable channels and water courses which carried the silt-laden waters of the mighty river to Egyptian farms. The area of the delta would normally pose serious problems in large-scale military movement, but the flood of the Nile had subsided, and the problem of movement would not now be so serious. West of the western branch of the Nile stretched the famous western desert, which was an extension of the great Libyan desert which itself formed the eastern portion of the Great Sahara. At this time of year the season was fine, February or March. The air was crystal clear and the nearness of the desert made the Arabians feel at home. In joyful mood, Ahmad bin Alas and his 12,000 stalwarts set off from Giza on the main route to Alexandria, west of the Nile. With the Muslims marched a group of Coptic leaders. Most of the Copts had thrown in their lot with the Muslims, and Macaucus had pledged to give all kinds of administrative help to felicitate the Muslim march to Alexandria. No troops from the Copts joined the Muslims. They were not going as far as that, but these leaders were to act as a command or liaison group to oversee and coordinate the various actions to be taken by the Copts in support of the Muslims. The Copts would repair the roads, build bridges, establish camps and markets, and make provisions and fodder available to the Muslim army. In fact, they became a vast labor and supply corps, charging only for what they provided in the way of material and provisions. Macaucus had already left for Alexandria not as a friend or agent of the Muslims, but as a Roman citizen. In spite of his grievance against Heraclius and his conviction that the empire would fall before the onslaught of Islam, he remained a subject of the empire. He got to Alexandria and resumed his normal life in his old city. He was no longer viceroy and wielded no political or military power in the country, but he was still Archbishop of Egypt and still commanded a good deal of religious influence over the Copts. 
during the campaign that followed, he was to be no more than a distinguished spectator. It was not long before the Romans at Alexandria heard about the advance of the Muslims from Giza and the help being given to them by the Copts. This made them very angry. Having known the Copts as a submissive lot, obedient citizens who would do whatever they were told to do, the idea of their working against the Romans by joining the Muslims was an unpleasant one. The Romans suddenly realized how unpopular they were, how unwanted in Egypt. As a reaction, Heraclea sent more vessels to Alexandria with troops and arms and equipment. The Roman general in command at Alexandria had already sent a covering force forward to watch the advance of the Muslims and give notice of their movement. Now he strengthened the covering force, which would occupy a series of positions between Babylon and Alexandria. The Romans even hoped that the Muslims would remain in Babylon long enough for the Romans to build up large forces and actually take the offensive against the invaders. On the third day of their march from Giza, the Muslim advance guard contacted a small Roman detachment at Ternot, now Tirana, on the west bank of the Nile. A light action followed as a result of which the Romans were driven out of the village and forced to withdraw northwards. The advance guard stopped here and Amr marched up with the bulk of the army to camp at Ternot. The next day, Amr remained in camp with the main body and sent the advance guard forward under Sharik bin Sumay. Sharik moved along the west bank of the Nile and some time in the afternoon, when he had covered almost 20 miles from the camp, he came up against a strong force barring his path. What surprised the Muslims was that the Romans did not maintain a defensive posture. They actually attacked the Muslims, and the latter, taken aback by the speed and vigor of the Roman assault, lost their balance and fell back. Finding the initiative snatched by the Romans, who were also greater in strength than his own force, Sharik ordered a withdrawal so that he could reorganize his force and then resume the advance. He got back to a village on the bank of the Nile and took up a position here. As a result of this action, the village has since been known as Qom Sharik, the Mount of Sharik. The next day the Romans came on. They had aggressive designs and were not going to let the Muslims decide how the war was to be fought. They intended to destroy this Muslim advance guard before the main body could come to its rescue. And with this intention, they came and attacked the Muslims at Qom Sharik. But although the Roman commander here was probably cleverer than the Muslim advance guard commander, he had not allowed for the superiority of the Muslim fighting man as a person and a warrior. The Muslims organized themselves for a defensive action and held the Romans, beating off assault after assault. Gradually, the Romans moved round the west flank of the Muslims and got behind them, cutting their communications, but not before the messenger had been sent off to Amr bin Alas to tell him about the Muslim predicament. The Roman force continued to press, but could not make any dent in the Muslim position. And this state of affairs continued for most of the day. Then suddenly fresh Muslim forces were seen rushing up from the south, and the Romans knew that their chances of success against the advance guard were gone. They quickly disengaged and as quickly pulled away to the north. Amr arrived to find the advance guard and Sharik bin Sumayi none the worse for their experience. But the aggressive action of the Romans had the effect of imposing caution upon the Muslims. This may well have been the Roman intention in order to gain time for the repair of the defenses of Alexandria and for the build-up of the defense capability of the city. Amr was conscious of this and of the need for speed but also realized that as they got nearer Alexandria, Roman resistance would increase and opposition would get stiffer. For the night, the Muslim army camped at Qom Sharik. The following day, the Muslims resumed the advance, 
After covering about 10 miles, they left the bank of the Nile and turned northwest on the road to Alexandria. On the second day of the march, they re-established contact with the Romans at Sultes, a little south of the present Tamanhur, where a strong Roman force awaited the Muslims. Whether it was the Roman intention here also to attack the Muslims is not known, but Umar did not give them a chance to do so. He organized the forward elements of his army for an attack and launched them into action. This led to some hard fighting but after a while Roman resistance broke and they withdrew rapidly in the direction of Alexandria. A day was spent at Sultes and then the advance was taken up again. For this phase of the advance, Amr formed a strong advance guard and placed it under command of his son, Abdullah. Amr also gave his son his faithful slave, the Greek Wardan, whom he had acquired in the campaign in Palestine, to act as standard bearer with the advance guard. Young Abdullah was quite a seasoned veteran and marched off from the camp in high spirits. Till the evening, he had met no opposition. The following day, the advance guard resumed the advance, followed closely by the main body of the army. Late in the morning, Abdullah bin Amr bin Alas came up against a sizable Roman force at Kiryon, 12 miles short of the city of Alexandria. This was the strongest Roman opposition faced by the Muslims since the fall of Babylon. We do not know who the Roman commander was at Alexandria at this time. Historians have not mentioned his name. It may have been the general who commanded the Roman army at Babylon, namely Theodorus, alias Manfur, alias the obnoxious snake. His performance at Babylon had been quite a creditable one, showing a tenacity of character which was instrumental in enabling the Romans to prolong the defense of the city for seven months. Whoever the general, his conduct of the covering troops or rear guard action from Babylon to Alexandria was a sound one. And as the march of the Muslims brought them closer to the Roman metropolis, the defensive capability of the Romans became stronger. The Muslim action at Sultais had brought them to within two days' march of Alexandria, and it was obvious that very soon the city would be under attack. The Romans were safer in their city. They had a strength of 50,000 soldiers. The city boasted powerful ramparts to give it defensive strength, and with their command of the sea, supplies and evacuation were no problem. They could maintain themselves in Alexandria by sea for an indefinite period, but with the Muslims coming up from the landward side and shutting the garrison in, the entire delta would be at their mercy and would no doubt go over to their side leaving Alexandria in the position of an isolated Roman island in a sea of Islam. This situation had to be avoided at all costs. In order to do so, the Roman commander sent out a very large force from Alexandria to Kiryon with orders to await the Muslim arrival, fight a tactical battle and inflict a defeat upon the Muslims, after which the invaders could be driven out of Egypt in a powerful counter-offensive. There is no record of the strength of this Roman force sent forward to meet the Muslims, but considering the overall Roman strength in Alexandria and keeping in mind the performance of this force in the action that followed, it could have been 20,000 strong. This force included a large number of Copts living in neighboring towns and villages particularly towns mentioned by historians as Balhib, Sakha, and Khais. There were also Copts who had fled Sultais as a result of the Muslim clash with the Roman covering force. These Copts were not convinced that the empire of Constantinople was about to fall and decided to stick to the imperial administration in Alexandria. And in loyalty and good faith, they took up arms against the Muslims. The entire force was positioned at Kiryon before the Muslims arrived and may well have been there even before the actions of Sultais. The Muslims arrived in the person of Abdullah bin Amr bin Alas, 
leading the advance guard and accompanied by the Greek Verdan acting as standard bearer. His father was close upon his heels with the main body of the army. Abdullah showed more courage than wisdom in this action and immediately on contact threw his advance guard against the Romans. He got what he deserved, of course, and a little later, feeling tired from his exertions and from the loss of blood from several wounds taken in the fighting, he thought to disengage and give himself and his men a rest. Overdone, he said to the standard bearer, let us withdraw a little to rest our souls. Wardan was not the man to relent. If it is the soul you seek, he told his young master, the soul is in front of you and not behind you. The son hung on and soon the father arrived to take the front in his own experienced hands. Amr was very pleased by the courage shown by his son and Wardan was generous enough not to say a word about their conversation. The action here now became a high-level military action with Amr bin Alas deploying the entire army for battle. What followed was the Battle of Kiryon. We do not know the details of this battle, and in the flat, even terrain of Kiryon, it is not possible to identify features of tactical importance. All we know is that the battle lasted more than 10 days. It involved some very hard fighting, and it produced a bloody harvest of Roman dead. At last the superiority and courage of the Muslims prevailed and the Romans, along with their Coptic auxiliaries, broke and fled, with the Muslims pursuing them to the gates of Alexandria. The Muslims were not inclined to be merciful to the enemy after such a hard struggle, and captured a large number of Copts who had taken part in the battle against them. These Copts were treated as slaves, since they had fought against the Muslims, breaking the Treaty of Macaucus, they could not be regarded as being under the protection of that treaty. But more about these slaves later. The following day the Muslims were at the outskirts of Alexandria. They had taken 22 days to advance from Giza to the sea, fighting four actions on the way, starting with a minor skirmish at Tarnut and ending with a bloody battle at Kiryon. What lay ahead of them was the greatest pride of Egypt, the city of Alexander the Great. End of chapter 7